Um, there's so much to be said about the doctrines of sanctification and justification. And, and of course, all of these biblical doctrines that we are looking at, that we are reading about, what we are studying, stem from the Savior. Stem from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the overall plan of God for salvation. And, and I believe, I, I truly believe that it's vital for us to understand these doctrines, at least to a degree. So let's look at uh, Romans chapter 5. I almost said Ephesians. Uh, Romans chapter 5. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to do something. I'm going to read something close to the King James Version on this this morning. The New King James Version. How's that? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Tribulations. Sufferings, persecutions, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You get that? For when we were still without strength, that is, in our weakness, in our sinful weakness. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like I said last week, the moment the word sinner is attached to us, and it is. We are as far removed from righteousness as anyone will ever get. So far, we are out of sight, meaning we are lost. The moment the word sinner is placed upon you, you are as far from God's righteousness as you can ever be. But he demonstrates his own love toward us, verse 8, in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice, this is the third thing we're going to rejoice about, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I believe that goes right back to verse 1. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. Father, you are the communicator of your truth. May your name be glorified in this moment. May you enlighten the hearts of the hearer to not only hear, but to receive, to understand, and to become doers in application. And Father, that includes all of us. Father, I, I pray that you would hide me in the shadow of the cross, that Jesus and Jesus only is exalted. You, Lord, authenticate all of the word, all of the message. May your name be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the past few months, we have been talking about the holiness of God and what it means for every believer who is commanded by God. God commands us, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And we can go to various places in Scripture to affirm that. We find that verse in 1 Peter 1.16. And we've discussed, to be, what it means to be sanctified. Sanctification is a means by which we become holier as followers of Jesus Christ. We are, we are, when we are saved, we are sanctified, declared holy 
but through the process of sanctification in our life, we become holier, and we need to be. We need to become holier. You know, there, there is a, a denomination who believes that the complete work of sanctification is done at the cross. Now, in, in, in a theological manner and context, I could say, well, yeah, I agree with that because of the outcome at the end of our life. But there is a process. Sanctification is a process as well throughout our lives. We are becoming holier, holier. Justification is God accepting and declaring an individual as being righteous before him. And, and this sets the groundwork where our holiness journey begins. So, before we get too far along, I want to give five comparison marks to highlight the differences between justification and sanctification. I want to give you five contrasting marks to highlight the differences between them. Now keep in mind that sanctification means to be set apart and declared holy, okay? Justification means that we are accepted and declared righteous. We are not made righteous. We are declared righteous because we can't be made righteous. If we are to be made righteous, we can go right back to a works righteousness where we earn our righteousness. We are declared righteous. The differences between justification and sanctification is Justification is a legal standing. We talked about the courtroom scene last week, last time we were together, and what that looks like as the prosecution presents his case and we are declared guilty, we are found guilty. And justification means that God has stepped in, and this is a legal standing, a judicial act of God, where sanctification is an internal condition. It's an inward condition. Something's going on inside of us. Justification is once for all time. It is once for all time. As a born-again Christian, now listen closely. You cannot be justified over and over and over again. It is a one-time deal with God accepting you and declaring you righteous through the Son. Through His Son, through the blood of His cross, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification, in contrast, is continuous throughout our life. You are becoming holier through sanctification. Justification, you are accepted, you are declared. No going back and saying, God, are you sure? Are you sure? I, I believe that most of us, if not all of us, at one time or another, have gone back, gone to the Lord in prayer, going way back uh, to the moment of our, our salvation and just checking in with God to make sure the whole, everything is covered under the blood. You know, we, we, the enemy comes along and he starts whispering the past into our mind, into our heart, and we begin to think possibly of things that we have done, sins that we have committed, and we might want to go back to the Lord, feel a sense to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, I just really want to, want to confess these sins to you again. Uh-uh. You can't do that. Once the sins have been forgiven, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. From us. So to go back and check in with God and call God to account of whether he is really able to forgive you of your sins is sin. Repent of that. Justification is entirely God's work. Sanctification, we as his children cooperate with God through willing obedience to his word, willing obedience to the power of the Holy Spirit. We cooperate. You have a choice. When commanded by Christ to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, you have a choice. You can either cooperate in willing obedience and pursue that and continue to grow in Christ's likeness, or you can say, you don't know my neighbor. They're the most miserable people. And it's not just about the neighbor across the yard, okay? 
It's the people in, that go to church with you too. We don't get to set the condition. We don't. We like to live in that area once in a while, but we don't get to set the condition. We must cooperate in sanctification as we grow in grace. That's why we call it progressive sanctification. But justification is entirely God's work. When God accepts you and declares you, you have nothing to do with that other than the fact that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Amen. Justification is perfect. Is perfect in this life. The, de de the declaration of righteousness upon us is perfect in this life. Why? Because we receive the perfect righteousness of Jesus, which is God's righteousness, by the way, given to us, imputed to us through the Son. So justification is perfect. Sanctification is not perfect in this life. Want me to prove it? Look around you. Look at the man or woman in the mirror. It's not perfect. Justification is the same in all Christians. It is the same in all Christians. It's not a certain measure given to this one, a certain measure given to that one. It's the same in everybody. You are accepted and declared righteous before God. Not just a little, but overwhelmingly. It's the same in everybody. Sanctification is greater in some than it is in others. Now think about that. That's true. I could say it's lesser in some than it is others. It is greater in some than it is others. But it's intended to be greater always for all of us. You see, as we cooperate in willing obedience in sanctification, Christ becomes the greater in us. Christ becomes the greater. We have used as our scripture text 1 Corinthians 6, 11, along with this message on the holiness of God and sanctification and now being justified by faith. And as I said last week in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, Paul is saying about, talking about those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, let, let me just go back here for a moment. Or do you not know? Now, remember, justification is being declared righteous. Righteous. Not yours, but Christ's, God's righteousness. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, see, be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this verse, verse 11. And such were some of you. Yeah. Boy, we, we don't get very far, do we, in, when, until we are reminded of where we have come from. And such were some of you. Period. And Paul really encourages the saints here, these, these saints of Corinth, of all people, some of the stuff they were involved in, why you would hang your head in shame. And he's saying to them, I, I can almost see this, I know this is a letter that was sent to them, you can almost see Paul standing before that congregation saying, but you were washed. But you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, by the way. You washed, regenerated, born again. You set apart and declared holy sanctification you accepted and declared righteous through Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Huh? Praise the Lord. There's no going back now, right? 
our eyes are fixed, our hands are steady to the plow. Yeah. In the moment, yes. Yeah. I'm all about it. All over that. But Monday morning's coming. The alarm's going to go off. Huh? No. We are on a continuum. We should be. In serving Christ. Keep in mind now that justification and sanctification work simultaneously in the life of an individual the moment, the very moment he or she is born again. Instantaneously, these things begin to work in our lives because there is a transformation taking place. There's a new life that has come in. The old life is gone, should be gone. The new has come. We are new creations in Christ Jesus because of salvation. Justification, sanctification are working in that moment simultaneously the moment we are born again. There's no waiting. There's no waiting around for it. You know, um, we, we tend to want to com compartmentalize salvation for some reason and, and to some degree, confusing as that would be, um, is that we feel that there are better Christians than ourselves. Well, yeah. Um, I think that we see sanctification at work more in some people than, than we do others. And that's not to judge people. Um, I, I think that we want to compartmentalize thinking that we didn't, we didn't get what others have. Oh, that's a lie. Okay? You got the full working of salvation the moment you came to Jesus. You got the full working. You, you received. You received the Holy Spirit, and there's a reason we receive the Holy Spirit. Your sins were forgiven because of Jesus. Eternity in His eternal kingdom, His eternal heaven, is ours. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. <laughs> amen, church, 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 church. We got the whole gamut of eternal life in Jesus. Because our lives are to be lost, wrapped up, consumed with the resurrected life of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. So, we've been accepted and we are declared righteous. Hmm. In justification... We know that for every born-again believer, that their sinful, unrighteous, guilty record has been wiped clean through the blood of Jesus. The sins of the past are gone. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, I, I feel you, man. Just sigh a sigh of relief. Thank God. They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from light. Is that how it goes? Dawn. Dawn. <laughs> Dawn. Oh, praise the Lord. As someone has once said, in trying to simplify the term of justification, it means it's just as if you have never sinned. However, <laughs> sometimes in our simplicity, we miss the mark completely. <laughs> that, that's true to a degree, but I believe there is much more for us to understand. The psalmist said in Psalm 32, one and two, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed. Blessed. What a wonderful place to be in. The blessed of the Lord. Huh? Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute or count iniquity. That's an interesting word there. Count or impute, uh, uh, reckon, they all mean the same thing. I like, I like the word impute. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yes, we are talking about the redeemed. Huh? Now, isn't that something that the psalmist would say that in whose spirit there is no deceit? What did Jesus say of Nathanael when 
his brother went to get him. Ah, here comes an Israelite in whom, in whom there is no guile, no, no deceit, no deceit. Uh, you know, that's pretty powerful when you think about it. Uh, Jesus is saying to him, Merlin Carruthers is his name, Merlin Carruthers, author of the book Prison to Praise, had firsthand experience of what it is like to be declared righteous. During World War II, he joined the army. And anxious to get into some action, Carruthers went AWOL, but was caught and sentenced to five years in prison. <laughs> Military takes that stuff pretty seriously. Instead of sending him to prison, though, the judge told him he could serve his term by staying in the army for five years. The judge told him if he left the army before, the term, before his term ended, he would have to spend the rest of his time... Where, where am I? <laughs> uh, in prison. <laughs> I need to compartmentalize these notes sometimes. <laughs> um, but Carruthers was actually released before his five-year term in the Army. And so he, re he returned to the prosecutor's office to find out where he would be spending the remainder of his sentence. Because he was found guilty. He was declared guilty. To his surprise and delight, Carruthers was told that he had received a full pardon from President Truman. It's a true story. The prosecutor explained to him, that means your record is completely clear. Just as if you had never gotten involved with the law. That is a wonderful picture, I guess, of what it means to be justified. To receive a full pardon of our transgressions, our iniquities, our sins to receive a full pardon. I was reminded at this point in my study, a song just popped into my head. I used to work out of high school, 18, 19 years old, for a body shop in my hometown. And, and the owner and his brother-in-law were, were, were wonderful born-again Christians. Both are ministers, actually, now. And uh, I remember the, the boss would start singing, uh, What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been torn out. I don't remember them anymore, goes the chorus of that song. The first verse says, I remember the day when I was bent low from the burden of sin and strife. Then Jesus came in and he rescued me and he gave me a brand new life. But now as I thank him day after day for washing my sins away, it seems I can almost hear the voice of my blessed Savior say, What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. Not that God forgets. God chooses to forget our sins. When He has pardoned us, He forgets. He, in, he intentionally lets it go. Isn't that wonderful? Huh? Is it any wonder that, that Jesus would say for us to forgive others? Even as I have forgiven you, we should forgive others with the same forgiveness that we want to receive from God. <laughs> that brings it into a different perspective, doesn't it? It takes it from mere words or thought to passion, desire, forgiveness, forgiveness. What sins are you talking about? Two things I want us to see concerning this wonderful doctrine of justification, which I know I probably won't get through all of this. I want to look at the benefits of justification for the believer. And the second point, you will be so surprised when I get to this second point of its brevity. <laughs> what is the believer's responsibility to this holy position of being justified? D, am I on? So what are the benefits of justification for the believer? We've read in Romans 5.1. 5.1 Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. As we have been justified by faith, 
It is a fact, then, that one has received the Lord's salvation, right? You should feel affirmed in the salvation of the Lord if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Drives me nuts when you meet Christians who are not sure of their salvation. It says right here, right here in, in Romans 5.1, Since we have been justified by faith, you can only be justified by faith if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Therefore, they, they are born again, this individual, you, me, those who are born again, have ex are accepted by God, you are declared righteous and sealed and sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Hmm. I want to talk about that in just a few moments. Christ frees the elect from the twofold debt of fulfilling the law and of making satisfaction for the breach of the law. Commentator says, Christ is our surety for this debt, and God accepts His obedience for us. It's being full satisfaction before God. Justification thus consists of remission of sins and imputation of Christ's righteousness. Let, let, me, let me read that first part. I, I want us to catch this. Christ frees the elect from the twofold debt of fulfilling the law and of making satisfaction for the breach of that law. We could never satisfy the righteous requirement of the law in and of ourselves. No human being could ever do that. The high priest of Israel could not do that. Mm. And... And the, the other part of that is when we breach that law as Christians, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an intercessor, Jesus the Christ. Christ is our surety of this debt. He is our guarantee of this debt. And God accepted His Obedience. Last week I said that Jesus, we were going back to Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 8, that Jesus had to be justified. Jesus was justified through the acceptance of his sacrifice and the resurrection and the ascension. Let me explain this a little better maybe. It tells us in the Gospels that those who heard the Gospel, Jesus was talking about the baptism of John, John the Baptist. And for those, he said, who heard and, and believed were baptized and justified God. That's different, isn't it? We are justified by God, but it's, Jesus was saying that their obedience justified God. What that means is that in their obedience and acceptance of Jesus, the Son of God, the standard of true belief, Christianity, however you want to say it, justified the righteous demand of God in the keeping of the law. We don't justify God in the sense that we are justified. Jesus is not justified by God in the same sense that we are justified. It was in the acceptance of his sacrifice. Jesus, had he failed, had he called 10,000 legion of angels, as he told his disciples in the night of his betrayal, he would have offset, derailed the whole plan of salvation. It, it would never have happened. And Jesus in his deity and his humanity, I don't want to make less of either one or magnify one over the other. In his deity and in his humanity, he had to suffer the full brunt of sin. Everything, everything for us. 
in order to defeat sin at the cross. The full brunt of it. He drank the cup full. He experienced things in his body because of our sin we will never, ever experience in this life. It tells us in Romans 8, verses 1 to 4, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus... Now, that's a, that's a transition here, isn't it? That's a transition when we're talking about the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus versus the old Mosaic law with its demands. We could not keep that, could we? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, the law in and of itself was not weak, the law was weak because of the human application on account of sin, was weak through the flesh on account of sin. He, Jesus, condemned sin in the flesh. In the flesh, not in His deity. In the flesh. It's, that's the only way it could be defeated through the unblemished, unspotted Lamb of God. The sinless Lamb of God who takes away, John the Baptist said, the sin of the world. That's the only way it could be. Condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. You get that? What the law could not do in the weakness of sinful flesh, Christ did in the flesh, condemned, He condemned sin in the flesh, thereby making each and every one of us all born again believers in the place of fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law in Jesus. You get it? Isn't that wonderful? Huh? That's great. What, what the high priest couldn't do, Jesus did. Our high priest, Jesus did. And he, he brings us right along with him. He says, come on, brothers and sisters, this includes you too. Yes, that's what he's done. You see, he's the surety of our debt. He's the surety of our debt, that twofold debt of fulfilling the law and for the breach of the law. Even now, in the breach of that law, He is still our Christ. He is still our Savior. Even when we sin, and we must repent and confess our sins, but oh, we're with Christ. We belong to Christ. And the full work of the cross which is inclusive, of course, of the whole thing. Resurrection, ascension, mediation. What a tremendous blessing. Oh, what a tremendous blessing upon the child of Almighty God. What a blessing. No condemnation, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> no, the only thing that Christ condemns is sin, it tells us. He condemned sin in the flesh. And once we have accepted the Lord as our Savior, we are not condemned. You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a dividing line. One of the things we can look at as a dividing line between the righteous and the unrighteous is that they are still underneath the condemnation of sin. They are still underneath the wrath of God. Yeah, and, and, and that's not a popular message out in the world at all, is it? Walk up to some stranger and 
you know Jesus, and you're going to get all kinds of different answers and say, well, then you are, the, you are underneath the wrath of God and you're going to hell. <laughs> no, don't, don't be cynical about it. We're to be passionate about it for the lost. But they're condemned. But those who have accepted Christ are not condemned. You know, no Christian, there isn't a Christian. <laughs> that wasn't worded right. There isn't a Christian that should walk around with their head hanging low, feeling condemned of themselves and their life that they once lived. Listen, your sins are underneath the blood. There is no condemnation. Don't you hang your head in regretful, despairing shame. That's sin. As a child of God, you look heavenward. And you thank God for saving your soul and forgiving you of all your sins. You are in a different standing before God now. You know what that is, don't you? You're standing in the righteousness of Jesus. When God looks at you, He no longer looks at you in your filthy, sinful garments. He looks at you in the righteousness of His Son because of what His Son has accomplished. Praise His name. Praise the Lord. Oh, what a tremendous blessing. And it's all because in Christ we have been accepted and declared righteous before God through the Lord Jesus by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit at work in us as well, isn't it? This Jesus whom God set forth as a big word, propitiation. Huh? Let me explain that. By his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, it says in Romans 3.25. Propitiation means that God the Father has accepted the sacrifice of his Son and that his, God's wrath, has been satisfied for those who receive the Son. God's wrath has been satisfied in Christ because he accepted the sacrifice of his Son. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. What a blessing. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You have been brought near. And, you know, in Jesus' day, in the temple, Herod's temple, you know, there was the courts, um, the outer courts, the inner courts, and there was a court for the priest. There was a court for the high priest. There was a court for uh, the common people. There was a court for the women. There was a court for the Gentiles. The Gentiles' court was way off, way off. For the nations, yes. And when Jesus suffered and died on the cross, rose again, it tells us here, that in him, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You know, where, you know what he's done? He tore the veil of the temple in two. And he didn't just bring us into the inner court. He didn't bring us just to the priest's court. He didn't bring us just to the holy place. He brought us directly into the holy of holies. Where the, the, the only individual ever to go into the Holy of Holies was the high priest. We have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. You couldn't do that on your own merit. You couldn't do it based upon how good you think you are. You could give all your money to, to charities and good works, and you could do everything in your power to, to, to help people. And when you stand before Jesus Christ on judgment and you list all of those wonderful things you did and he asks you, but what did you do with me? Oh, oh, I did all these wonderful things. They're going to hear, depart from me for I never knew you. We can only be brought near through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. And there's an accountability to that. There's a responsibility to that, to be hearers and doers of the word, not only in just once in a while, but daily, daily in obedience, submitting our will to His in all things. 
That's the, even your attitude, even in your conversations. Because we are called to walk a straight and narrow path. God's preparing us for His eternity. God is preparing us for His eternity. I'll close with this. That's point one. I have six. We talked about being sealed. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14 instructs us, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's the Christian. Okay, I'm reading from the New King James here. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. It's already owned. Purchased possession is ownership, right? Yeah, it is. You know, when somebody asks you about your salvation, when somebody asks you about making heaven, don't say, well, I, I, I hope, I, I, I hope I make it. I'm going to lay hands on you. And when I get done throttling you because of what you should know, this is saying He owns us. He possesses us. He has purchased us, He says, to the praise of His glory. So, so what does it mean when it says the believers are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit? We, it tells us here He's a guarantee of our inheritance. He's a guarantee of our inheritance. However, there's more to that as well. The Holy Spirit is the seal of what we have received in Christ Jesus and what we have been promised in Christ Jesus. What we have received and what we have been promised in Christ Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit as a seal. That is, again, I'll remind you, salvation, righteousness, and eternal life. Speaking of Abraham, we find in Romans 4.11, it says this about Abraham and the covenant God made with him after he had been declared righteous because of his belief. Believing God, he was declared righteous and he received the sign of circumcision, Romans 4.11, a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had while still uncircumcised. I want you to get this. He received and he received the sign of circumcision, the sign, as a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. Abraham was declared righteous before the act of circumcision. Circumcision didn't qualify what God declared Abraham to be righteous. He says, I'm going to give you a seal. This is a seal of what I have already declared upon you. Why? That he might be the father of those who believe, though they are uncircumcised. That righteousness might be imputed to them also. If you are born again, you have been sealed with the promise of of the Holy Spirit, declaring you righteous and accepted as a child of God. What a benefit. Huh? What a benefit. No one, no one can just say, I know God. I know Jesus. Many say that thinking that they're confessing some form of Christianity, allegiance to Christ, and that's not true. This, this separates that. That puts a, a wide margin before them. And how important then is it that we continue to declare this powerful hope we have in Jesus? That a person, and I don't care who it is, husband, wife, neighbor, son, daughter, whoever, I don't care what they've done, I don't care how hard they seem or appear to be. When Jesus breaks through, he'll change that life. The vital importance of receiving Jesus, receiving the salvation of the Lord, 
being accepted and declared righteous is life transforming for us. What are we doing with it? Huh? What are we doing with it? 